Okay, so it's Thursday, September 20th, and we are going to be looking yet again at complex XPath expressions. Um, if you attend this webinar regularly, you know I've talked about XPath in the past, and we're going to talk about XPath again. And, and part of the reason for that is that it is one of these fundamentals that you just really need to understand to be able to push your forms to the next level. Uh, the better you understand XPath, the better you're going to understand how InfoPath works. And as we all know, the more we know about how something works, the easier it is for us to use it, to manipulate it, to bend it to our bedding. So let me see if I can remember how to change slides here. Uh, this is the technical jazz. We've already put that in the in the chat. You've got to use link attendee. If you can't hear me right now, you're not using the right thing. I'm really sorry about that. We'll be posting the recording later. Of course, if you can't hear me, that isn't very helpful information to you. But I'm going to give you a second to read this in case you can't hear me. Um, our goals, you know, we're trying to get through this kind of quickly for you. We're trying to make it relevant. Um, nothing's really super pre-prepared, so if I screw things up, we'll consider it just part of the learning experience and move on. Um, if you give us contact info, we'll send you some links. I, I don't have a ton of links for this. You'll see when you look at my bare bones demo form. But that's because we're going to be talking a little higher level this time, a little more metaphorically, because what I want you to do is learn how to create these for yourself. We'll talk more about that in a second. So at any rate, we'll try to, to get through this. Okay, so XPath, what is it? It's how we get our information out of our XML. It's what InfoPath uses to select data from an XML file. It's what all other things that deal with XML use to select data from an XML file. Um, if we were SQL data wonks, we'd use select foo from foobar where bar equals XYZ. So if you've ever used access, if you've ever used SQL, you've probably written some select statements in your life so that, that you can select some specific rows of data. Uh, XPath is doing the same thing for our XML data. And so in XPath, we use predicates instead of a where clause. So that where clause above, where bar equals x, y, z, it's the same thing as the predicate we see in the XPath expression that's inside those square brackets. We're saying where uh, the bar belonging to Baz, in this case, is equal to x, y, z. So this XPath right here contains uh, some absolute XPath and some relative XPath. Uh, foo bar Baz foo, that's absolute. That's the complete XPath to foo. Inside the predicate, you see the dot, dot, forward, slash, my bar equals x, y, z. That's relative. My bar is relative to foo. It's basically saying, so from foo, go here and find the one that's equal to x, y, z, or the ones that are equal to x, y, z. So I don't always have a lot of time in advance of these webinars to kind of think things through. And this time, we chose this topic back in August, which means I had a chance to, to kind of contemplate how to explain absolute and relative XPath in a way that might make more sense to more people. And the reason I like metaphors, just to go kind of English lit major on you. The, the reason I like metaphors is I think if we can describe something as being like something we're familiar with, it makes it more accessible to us. And so as I was considering absolute and relative XPath, the metaphor that came to me as being the most accurate has nothing to do with trees. We're constantly in XML talking about trees. We're going up the tree. We're going down the tree. And instead of trees, what made sense to me was maps. And an absolute XPath, like the one we, whoops, I went too far, oh, spoiler alert, um, an absolute XPath, like FUBAR, BAS, FOO, it's absolute. And an absolute XPath is like a point on a map. So if I give you, at least the theoretical you, if I give you, because I, mean, I can't find my way out of a paper bag, but if I give you a latitude and longitude, you should be able to locate that 
from anywhere. It doesn't matter where you are if you've got a big enough map or a latitude and a longitude and there's a point on the map that shows you what your destination is. Your location with this information is irrelevant. And so with an absolute expat, we are being, we are providing whatever we're using to get the XML out. We are providing that with information that is the equivalent to a point on a map to a latitude and longitude. When we talk about relative XPath, and again, we're going to go just up one slide again and look at this, this dot dot my bar, which is relative to my foo. When we talk about relative XPath, I think the appropriate metaphor is driving directions. Because for driving directions, it matters very much where you currently are. <clears throat> so absolute XPath, doesn't matter where you are doesn't matter. You can still find this place. With driving directions, if I am driving from Kirkland to my house, I take a very different route than if I was driving from Portland to my house. And all of a sudden, where you currently are becomes extremely important. Now, the good news is that we have tools and we have um, functions and we have relative paths that can help us with this determination. And one of those tools is the current function. But again and again, what I see in the forum and what I remember distinctly struggling with myself, because I, I rolled my own education on this stuff, was current. Current is giving me my current location. But frankly, a lot of times when I first started working with InfoPath and XPath, I had no idea where I was. And I didn't feel like I had any tools to tell me where I was. So I used current blindly. I, I sprinkled it on like a bad cook uses too much salt, right? Because I didn't, I didn't really know what it meant. Therefore, I didn't know the appropriate usage for it. And I think that's what's been a big battle for me with self-teaching XPath all along, is that some of these real basics I didn't understand. So I didn't have the proper building blocks to really understand what InfoPath was doing or what I could do with it. Once you start to understand some of these building blocks, a lot of things <laughs> reveal themselves to you, right, become, become magically apparent. So current is where you currently are. What if you don't know where you are? And I think that happens to us a lot in InfoPath. We forget that our location in terms of current has to do with the control we're setting the rule on. It has to do with the type of rule. Are we setting a field's value? Then current may mean one thing. Are we formatting the control itself? Current may mean another. But there's ways in InfoPath to find your location. And we're going to look at a couple of those in the demo. You can use calculated values. You can use the local name function. Now, InfoPath will show you if you click on a control. But again, this can, what current means can vary depending on what you're trying to do as well. Current versus dot, right? We've all seen the dot shorthand. InfoPath makes liberal use of it. So dot is the relative path to the current node. Current returns the current node. So in general, if you were to write um, a, just a quick and easy, you know, main data source formula, you've got a condition, you want um, field one equal to dot, right? Field one equal to dot. In general, you could replace that with field one equal to current. You know, dot and current are going to be the same field. We're pretending you're on field two here in case we've gotten lost in the weeds. Um, so in general, current and dot, same thing, except when you're, except when it's not, right? So there's the problem, except when it's not the same thing. So in a predicate, they could be very different. And so if we look at this top one, this top XPath expression, this is going to select every food node where the saturated fat value is equal to the current food node's total fat value. So this X path, the food node that gets selected, is going to be completely dependent on what current means in this particular situation. This is going to be completely dependent on knowing exactly where we are. Okay, this second X path expression, the predicate is basically saying, give me every food node where the saturated fat value in that food node is equal to the total fat value in that very same food node. Because in the second XPath expression, the dot refers to the food 
the food node that is, you know, just a few words prior to that, the one right before the square bracket. Okay, so it refers to this food node, this particular food node. It looks at each node and says, hey, saturated fat equal to total fat? No, nope, you're not my guy. Oh, it is? Oh, you are my guy, right? The one above is completely dependent on what node we're currently on when the formula executes, when the XPath executes. I hope I'm not, I hope I'm not muddying things. <laughs> so let's look at this in terms of actually seeing some XML, because that's the only way this stuff starts to make sense. So this particular food node, you can see it has a total fat of zero, and it has a saturated fat of zero. The X path above will select this particular food node. We don't know whether it will select any others without looking at the entire XML, but we know this one will be picked. However, our other X path expression, we have no idea if this food node will be selected or not. It all depends on what total fat is in the current node, and that depends on what node are we on. What node is our current node? Okay, so that's the that's the difference between dot and current, and that's one of the things to think about. Is if you're writing a formula, and you're referencing a secondary data source, you you can't just let, let's just let's just pretend you're on a field in your main data source, and you're writing a formula that's going to be referencing a secondary data source, and you need a predicate. If you use dot, that's going to refer to whatever node you're picking from the secondary data source. If you use current, that's going to refer to whatever node the rule is actually on. I hope that, I hope that's helpful. What about repeating data? Um, if the control, now I'm speaking specifically to InfoPath at this point, if the control is not repeating, you'll only ever get the first item found that matches your criteria. So if you write an XPath that could return multiple results, if your control is not repeating, you will only ever see the first result returned. And that is going to be in the order they appear in the XML in the data source, okay? Um, unless you specify otherwise, right? So you see how in the second expression, I've added a second predicate. My first predicate selects all of the food nodes where saturated fat equals the total fat of the current node. And then my second predicate in the square brackets is saying, oh, and get me the second one of those. Right? So there's a there's a, a second predicate that's saying get me the second one. Okay? And we're going to look at this stuff in the demo. So much for all my fine thoughts of, oh, we'll get wrapped up by 8.30. No, we still might. So specifying data sources, you can see the difference between these two lines. I know you can. So when we are specifying a data source in an expression in InfoPath, um, if we're selecting the main data source, InfoPath uses get-dom, lowercase g, capital D-O-M, empty parentheses. When we're selecting a secondary data source, it uses get-dom with a capital G, no hyphen, and the data source name inside of quotes, inside of the parentheses. I mention this because sometimes when you're creating a complex XPath expression, you may decide that you just want to put bits and pieces of it in Notepad and cobble it together as you go, which, which I do. And it's good for you to know uh, how to refer back to a main data source. Let's just say you're currently on a, a field in a secondary data source. It's good to know how to refer back to the main data source, and this takes you right to to write to the very root, you would start with my, my fields, whatever. Okay, and we'll take a look at those. And down we go. And finally, a good way to see how InfoPath is handling these things, what InfoPath does, what the XPath looks like, is to basically set up your condition in a rule condition or a conditional format, change that first drop down to the expression, and it will show you the, the XPath that InfoPath is using. And I encourage you to do this frequently because this will help you. And there's also the edit XPath checkbox in the formula editor. And the more you do this, the more you look at what's underneath the UI, the more familiar and comfortable you're going to get with these things. Um, this also allows you to completely ignore this ridiculous five condition limit in the UI. Uh, just kind of, you know, figure out what your expressions are and then you can put them together with ands. Please note that's all lowercase. Uh, or, and you can put parentheses as needed. Now, I don't know about you, but I struggle with this UI in terms of understanding um, how things are being grouped. I, I have a hard time understanding if things are, are being grouped together with ands and ors. I just, 
I am not mathy. I think I've probably made that clear. And and because of that, I really need to sort of sit things out and wrap some parentheses around them in Notepad or, or a text editor and see how I want everything evaluated. So a lot of times, even if I'm within the five condition limit, I'll still use the expression. And I'll just copy my expressions in the Notepad. I'll group them as I need to. I'll put in my ands and my ors. I usually use, you know, five sets of parentheses more than I have to. I'll paste it back into the expression. You know, when I save it, InfoPath will parse it out into uh, separate conditions to fulfill the five condition limit and then use an expression for the last one. And I just let it do that. And then I don't get quite so confused as to how it's going to handle the evaluation of my expressions because that does always leave me somewhat baffled. So let's take a quick look at a demo here. And I'm going to go ahead and share out my, my monitor as soon as I remember how to do that. OK. So I'll wait for that to load. OK. It looks like, at least on my side, that it's starting to render. So hopefully everybody can see my, my screen. So in this, this little demo form, I've got a secondary uh, data connection here to um, this nutrition XML. I use this XML quite frequently. Like I've said, it's, it's, uh, it's complex enough. You know, it's got some attributes. It's got some, some different nodes that, that I find it useful for, for things like demos. So first, let's look at a couple of these, um, a couple of these XPath expressions that I shared in the slides. Um, the first one is, now in this case, I've gone down to the name node. And I've said I want the name where uh, the saturated fat is equal to the current node's total fat. Okay, and then in the second one, I've moved I've moved my uh, predicates here up to the food node. Now the reason I did that was because I want to select the second the second food node. Okay, and the food node is my actual repeating node. So let's take a preview of this, and we will look and see what we've got here. So if I preview this, now I'm going to tell you straight off that I don't really have anything where the total fat is equal to the saturated fat except for the one we looked at already. But I do know of some things, um, I do know the saturated fat values of a few things. So in this expression, we're going to return uh, any, actually the first uh, name from, <laughs> Sorry, just got tongue tied. We're going to return the first name from uh, a food node where the saturated fat is equal to the current total fat. And current right now is this node right here, this food node right here. And then in the second one, we're going to return the second of these food nodes. So I'm just going to change this total fat to 14, which I know is, is something that is below me in the saturated fat. And I know there's like three or four that are like this. So. Now you can see I've got truffles, white chocolate. That's the first one in my list that has uh, the saturated fat that's equal to the current total fat here. And then the second one is chocolate mint. Um, if I were to change this to one, right, I think we've got a... We've got bagels right here below. And it looks as if nothing else has a total fat of a saturated fat that's equal to 1, because you can see we don't have anything returned in our, in our second slot here. So there's several ways we could have written this. Um, we could have moved this right here could have been moved over next to food instead of after name, just like driving directions, right? There's, there's a couple ways we could have gotten this result. Um, in this case, I put it on name, but it could have been on food. We would have removed this basic relative path. Current would have stayed the same because current refers to this particular repeating section. Current refers to food in this instance. So. We can use calculated values to kind of let us know where we're at. Um, there's two that I use kind of frequently when I'm, when I'm a little lost or not quite sure of something. And one is going to be, whoops, just this, just a dot, right? And that is relative to 
that, that is our, our relative path to the node we're currently on. So in this case, that dot is going to be the food node. And the other one I use a lot is the local name function. So you can insert a function of local name. And again, in this case, I'm going to use dot. It's this particular guy. So where am I? Now, I would be able then to move these around into different locations if I wanted to get more information about different things. So I could, for example, put a section attached to this name field, right? And then if I copy these and drop them in here, I'll have to change my paths because InfoPath helped me yet again. So here we go, calculated value properties. Local name, you see how it changed that to two dots? Back up to the parent. It noticed that I moved it, so we'll just fix those back up. And this one probably got changed too. Yep, two dots. Look at it help me. And let's go ahead and say OK. So now we've got uh, name because we're inside the name section, right? And we've got also the value of name there. And if we preview this, we can see, right, you see how in our section that's bound to food, you see how we have all of the information coming back from that when we use the dot syntax? So using dot gets us back all of the text from here, right? Not our attributes. No attributes are being returned, just our nodes. So you can see units gram, that's an attribute, serving is 29, okay? Go ahead, and down below then we've just got the name information. If we move to, I've got another view here. Let's move to our second view. Okay, and so in this view, I have calculate value properties. Okay, in this view, what we're looking at is we're looking at, and let's edit the XPath. Okay, we are looking at the main data source A field now. Repeating group, right? So this is going to return the first match, okay? If there were multiple matches, this would always return the first match. Anytime you're dealing with a repeating group, unless you've indicated otherwise by using an additional predicate, you are always going to get back the first one, okay? And I remind you of this because I see this as being a confusion for a lot of people. And frankly, I've had a head desk moment myself over this. So it's really important to keep in mind that if you're getting back the first one, and first is in the order that it's in the XML file. Okay, so this particular expression is saying, get me the A field, which I can, you can see these are nice names, where another field is equal to the current total fat. Okay, so in this case, current, right, is equal to the food node because we are inside um, a food node, a repeating section bound to the food node. Okay, now if I change this to dot, here's another example of why these two are not interchangeable. Let's change it to dot, right? And you can see we have a problem. We've just got this total fat. And if we say, OK, show details, right? My A field total fat does not point to a valid location. OK, and so I want to tell you that in the past, when I was trying to teach myself this stuff, I would frequently just look at this and be like, huh, what are you talking about? You know, and I would dismiss these. And, and, and now I actually find them informational because they tell me where my mistake is. I mean, if you look at this, if you read this, you can tell by looking at your data structure, group, repeating group, my A field, slash total fat, that you have effectively told InfoPath the via XPath that you expect to find a total fat node underneath A field, right? That lets you know that what you did was incorrect. I mean, I understand. It doesn't give you guidance as to what might be correct. But a good approach might be to try current, right? And we can go ahead and you can see that this time InfoPath didn't do any weird cleanup. And if we verify our formula, we're OK. Now, now this is, um, you know, trial and error is, is one way to start learning these things, but blind trial and error isn't going to get you anywhere. So, so read the read the message when you get one of those errors. Try to understand what part of your formula is wrong. Read read what it's trying to tell you. What it's saying is, hi, I tried to find this node you told me about, and it's not there. And so it can help you track down where your error in the expression is. Now, this isn't super complex. InfoPath could have built this for you itself. But I will tell you, if you're using 2007 or, or uh, 
bless your soul, 2003, that InfoPath wasn't always that great about inserting current for you. So there are occasions where it might have used a full path instead of using current, in which case you may need to adjust it manually. So we'll go ahead and say OK. We'll preview this very quickly. And then we will look at one more, uh, one more thing, and then we'll call it. So this is my test. And this was, it was total fat, wasn't it? I think I've got some 14s. Nope. 19? There we go. And you can see that in these cases where there's a total fat of 19, I'm getting back this little, this little, uh, this little value, right? Because we're getting back test here from A. So one more off we go to demo three. Okay. And so in this case, I'm trying to remember what I've got going on here. Conditional formatting. So here, if we manage rules, and I'm basically hiding if, OK, so this was what I wanted to show you here. Now here, I've selected category from my subcategory. So I've got these two other XML that I added as data sources. I added a category. It has category name and ID in it. And then I've got subcategory where uh, it has um, the category ID along with the rest of the XML. And so this is the category from the subcategories group. And so I, this holds an ID, OK? Where category is not equal to, and then let's use a formula here, and let's look at the X path. So what I've got here is I'm looking at the category here in my subcategory repeating group, and I'm saying where it is not equal to, get the ID from categories, right? Where the name of that category is equal to, in the main DOM, a field. Now, mind you, this is going to be looking at the first A field, OK? And another reason to be comfortable with changing this to the expression is uh, the first time I created this formula, I got it wrong. And I used is equal to instead of is not equal to and was baffled because of having opposite day when I went to preview it. But watch what happens if I just change this. Right Now I have to go fill that out again. You can imagine that's annoying when you're short on time. I'm sure you've all had it happen. Just, just change it to the expression and change it from you know, not equal to equal. Okay. Say OK. And you see how it just it parses that just nicely, uh, the expression, equal, not equal. This is yet another reason to get comfortable with dealing with these expressions. Let's just say OK. Uh, this field, A field, I'm using a drop down to the categories to, to return the name. So if we preview it, um, I should have added some conditional formatting about blanks. Obviously, I didn't. All right, you can see, you know, everything works as anticipated. So while somewhat artificial, there, there may be a reason why you'd want to store a name here instead of an ID, like, for example, SharePoint property promotion, things of that nature. Um, and, and in instances like that, you can create these more complicated expressions. And InfoPath UI will help you in 90% of the time. It's just that last 10% where you need to be comfortable getting in there and just sort of adjusting things yourself. Use things like expression boxes to let you know where you're at. You can use things like expression bo boxes to let you know what something's evaluating to. Uh, for example, you could uh, throw an expression box underneath one of these and, and evaluate just a portion of this, right? You could go evaluate just this guy, right? We could use a formula, edit X path. We could copy this. I, I believe it or not, I know it seems primitive. This is how I troubleshoot sometimes if something's not working the way I want it to. And that's because I don't have, um, <laughs> I haven't been blessed with a ton of patience. Right? And so I toss a, a, a calculated value in here. Now you'll notice that I put this inside of my repeating table. Right? Because the XPath might be different outside. Right? So you want to, you wanna, if you're using calculated values, put them in a section bound to the fields you're concerning yourself with so that you get an accurate reflection of what your X path should be. Um, and so once I select one of these, I should start seeing, you can see I've got a 1 because it's a category ID of, of 1 is what's being returned. Finally, the last thing I just want to show you because it was revelatory to me is you know how we run out right, of expressions here. And now we can't add any more. And so what, what I will do here is just simply start creating uh, what I need is equal to test, right? And let's just pretend like I've created 72 of these. No. <laughs> but if, if you don't know the X path, create what you need using the UI. And then you just copy them out, right? right? 
And now, um, and name is not equal to, you know, testing or, and you can put in some parentheses. I'm just going to type it at this point. Our name equals other and name not equal to. Obviously, this makes no sense, but here we go. So this is this is kind of what I'm talking about. Oh, and if you're not using a, a text editor with parenthetical matching of some kind, wow, I'd really encourage that if you're going to work with XPath because you start getting into your square brackets, your parentheses, things of that nature. It's really nice to, to have this parenthetical highlighting. It helps you find your errors a lot more quickly and a lot more easily than, than InfoPath is going to. right? And so we can do something like this. And I'll just delete all these middle ones. You can do something like this and say, OK, right? And InfoPath parses it into parses it into the different conditions for you. And it's left it as an expression because I had the, the additional parentheses, right? So there you have it. There's some basics. Um, you can use these basics to build up more complicated expressions. If you don't have the basics, your complex expressions will fail. If you're having trouble with a complex expression, strip it down. Take it to pieces. Check each piece. Check your pieces in a section or control that is bound to where you know you're eventually going to use it. Um, conditional formatting is going to um, have slightly different XPath sometimes than something that would be a formula developed from the field itself, so that's worth keeping in mind. Use local name to find your node. Use uh, uh, current or dot to find the value of where you're at. So, you know, sometimes you think you're, let's take a look here again, sometimes you think you're here, and actually you're here. Really important to know where you're at. And, and I hope that the metaphor of map and driving directions helps you um, really kind of understand uh, XPath and, and really helps you kind of think through the challenges because all you're doing with XPath is you're saying, okay, given this huge XML, how do I know which one I want? And and how do I get there from where I'm at? Do I care where I'm at? Does it matter? If it's absolute, you might not. It might not matter where you're at. But if it's relative, where you're at does matter. And there's a difference between dot and current and understanding that will help you create these XPath expressions. So I'm going to go ahead and, and mute. If anybody has any questions, uh, pop them into uh, the, the chat section, and I'll be happy to answer questions for a bit. Okay, well, if there's no questions, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, wrap up the recording portion of this at least, and I'll keep the chat window open for just a bit longer in case anybody has something they pop up with. Um, as always, you can get our samples just by contacting us. And of course, if you have any questions um, directly from me, feel free to email me. I'm uh, hillary.stupa at qdabber.com. And the forum is always there as well at intopathdev.com for your help. Talk to you later. Bye.